We're excited that you've dialed into our digital sermon series here at NBC for 2021. Our mission here at NBC is to help grow resilient, biblically rooted families. And to that end, the teaching of God's word is our primary tool of ministry. We trust that these teachings, these sermons will be an encouragement to you and your family. We also want to encourage you to check out all the different activities we have throughout the year that focus on teaching of God's Word for you and your family. So make sure you check out our website at MuskokaBible.com. We trust again that this season, this summer, these sermon series will be an encouragement to you. God bless. All right, good morning. Whoa, that is nice and loud. I love it. Love it, love it. So I'm going to say hi to you over here because I'm probably not going to look over here very much, all right? But you're going to get this side of my face, which I do think is the better side. So that's really good on you for sitting over there. Uh, And welcome to you and my family that's probably up at the cabin saying, we've heard dad talk enough, don't need to do that, Uh, but so glad to be here and uh, excited for what the Lord is going to do uh, with us this morning. So um, I, I enjoy running. It's one of the things that allows for me to get a lot of my frustrations and energy out. And um, I I went to the store a few months ago and bought this overpriced watch, which basically tells you where you are and how much you're breathing and all these things. But people told me it was a good idea. And so I did it and I got it home and I spent about 24 hours, not straight, but a good day of frustration trying to get this thing to actually do what it said it was supposed to do. The box looked absolutely amazing. The person wearing it seemed like they were walking with Jesus somewhere. They were having so much joy. And yet when I put it on, it just made me want to smash it because it wasn't doing anything that it promised. It Ultimately, I had to call the company and say, what's going on? What's wrong? And they just said, oh, give us a serial number. And they said, oh, the wrong version of the hardware or software or whatever where is on your watch. Just go ahead and plug it into your computer and everything will be okay. And about an hour later, everything was fine. I wanted to make sure I ended that story. The watch is okay. It's all good. We get along. But the problem was it was the wrong version. It was the wrong version. It wasn't, it wasn't working. And do you ever feel like you have the wrong version of Christianity? Do you ever feel like someone is talking to you about something that you thought you knew, but it seems so foreign to you? Maybe you've gone into the bookstore, a Christian bookstore, I'm not necessarily saying here, but uh, Indigo or Chapters. So we walk into a bookstore in Montreal, our uh, Christian section is very, very tiny, and it's just full of big smiley faces. I call it the perma-smile section. And it seems like that version of Christianity is full of perma-smiles and no hardship at all. And in fact, if you're going through any sort of trial or suffering, it's probably your fault. It's probably the fact that you don't have enough faith. And maybe they might even say, if you just give us a little bit more money, then the Lord will come alongside you and get you out of this trial. It can seem like the hardships that you're going through is your fault and my fault. But I just want to say, this is not real Christianity. Indigo is selling you a false version of Christianity. Now, we might talk about Jesus. There might be some Bible verses. There might be some nice things in there. But a lot of what's being pushed is not the real Jesus. Because as I read scripture, I find all kinds of things like lamentation. Who knows that there was a book in the Bible called Lamentations? Okay, three of you do. You all obviously need to come back to Bible camp next year and we'll preach out of Lamentations. That'll be an uplifting week, right? But there are Psalms, right? Psalms, whole book of them, 150 of them. That was the song book for for Israel, the people of God. And so many of them are, are songs of sorrow, Why would God give us lamentations and songs of sorrow? Because there are moments in life that we lament and are sorrowful and are mourning. In fact, it's sorrow, lamentation, and mourning that remind us that we're human in a broken world. And so what James is going to do for us in James chapter 1, verse 1 to 18, is he's going to prepare our hearts for two intense realities that all of us go through. I think it was D.A. Carson that says um, that that all of us are going to suffer, 
right? And it doesn't take a scholar to, to tell us that, right? But you're going to suffer and you're going to experience it. It's a reality that we're all going to go through. And so this is where we're going to be this morning. James chapter 1, uh, verse 1 to 18. And this is all around, this whole week is around how not to play church, meaning how not to be a hypocrite, how not to just play the part, but actually really engage with the Christ of Christianity. So that's what we're going to look at this morning, trials and temptations. All right? You're here? You're with me? All right. Okay. You don't know limitations in the Bible, but you're here, and I'm so glad that you are. Um, by the way, I'm overly sarcastic sometimes, all right? You can ask me Wednesday night, why are you sarcastic? I don't know. It just comes out. It's not my fault. Uh, James 1, 1 says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes in the dispersion, greetings. I, I love how he starts that out. James, okay, this is who I am, this is my name, welcome, uh, but I am a servant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. He starts out by sharing his identity, the same identity we spoke a little bit about yesterday, if you were with us, that identity of servant, that we're not just a servant in general or a volunteer, but we're a servant of God and of Jesus. This is our identity. This is who we are. This is what we do all the time. And I, I challenged people yesterday to work out of that identity, not to be walking around the camp looking for what I can grab and take, but rather with open hands, how can I serve other people? Where do I see needs around me that I can be serving, and, and be good news for people today. See, we serve his purposes all the time. And if you're a real servant, if we're really servants, then we actually expect that life is going to be hard. Just let that sink in, right? If you're a real servant, <clears throat> we don't really use this, this word anymore, um, but a bond servant, slave, you're a slave. You do not expect for life to be easy. You expect for things to be hard. And Jesus was our, not just our example, but he was an example. As he served us by going through temptations. Do you realize that as the Holy Spirit led Jesus out into the wilderness and to be tempted by Satan himself, Jesus was tempted for you, overcame those temptations for you so that he could be our perfect substitute and go as the perfect lamb of God to die in our place. He went through those temptations perfectly for you and I, and Jesus went through the darkest trial, the darkest night that anyone will ever go through where he knew that he was going to experience separation with the one that he has never experienced separation with ever, where he was going to bear the weight, the full weight of the wrath of God as he hung on the cross. He went through the darkest trial, the darkest temptations for you and for I, and he overcame that for us. He overcame that for us. So you and I can be sitting here in lawn chairs, listening to the good news being proclaimed that it is done. There's nothing that you and I have to go and do to rescue ourselves. You've been rescued because he came through those temptations and trials, but it doesn't mean that we're going to live a life with perma smiles and happy clappy all the time. Life is hard. My goodness, life is hard. When you begin to follow Jesus, life gets harder, except now you're no longer alone. We don't have to grieve and mourn without hope. We have hope, a confident expectation. We have an anchor for our soul in Jesus. And trials and temptations don't indicate a lack of faith. Don't believe that lie. Trials and temptations do not indicate a lack of faith. So let's get into these two things, trials and temptations. Trials, what are they? Well, they're external. Okay, they're coming at us from the outside. They're undesirable. I didn't wake up this morning at 5.30 and be like, oh, I hope I get some trials today, right? That's not how I began the day. I hope, Lord, please help my children to sleep. I've been fasting all night long, hoping that they would sleep till just seven o'clock. I'm not asking for eight, just seven, right? But we don't wake up hoping for, for trials. We don't desire them. But trials are, are certain. Uh, do, hey, kids, do you know that, that little book, The Bear Hunt? 
going on a bear hunt. So I went for a run this morning and I was secretly hoping to see a bear. I, I shot a bear once. I didn't have a gun because I'm in Canada and apparently we don't have those here. Um, but I was hoping to see a bear. And then I was processing through like, what am I going to do if I see a bear? You know, like, I, I don't know if I can outrun them. I can't climb a tree. They can climb trees. But nonetheless, I'm digressing. A uh, bear hunt. We're going on a bear hunt. We're going to catch a big one. It's a beautiful day. We're not scared, right? And then the whole book is getting to like, you know, big fields or mountain or whatever. You can't go around it. You can't go under it. Can't go over it. You've got to go through it. And that's the trials. They're certain. And we try to get around them, don't we? We try to protect our lives from, from trials, but we just can't. They're certain, especially for followers of Jesus. And James isn't talking about trials in general. Like, I had a bad hair day. I don't know if I want to go out today. And I know for some of us, that's a real trial. But these are trials that are uh, connected to following Jesus specifically. Now, what kind of trials would James and his people be going through? Well, number one, they, they would be mocked on a regular basis for worshiping a, a man who was killed because people didn't believe in the resurrection. James and his followers would have lost some of the privileges that they, that they had. James and his people would have been marginalized to a subsection in society. James and some of his people would have lost family members, not like they lost them on the bear hunt, but losing them to death. That that was a certainty that when you bowed your knee to Jesus instead of Caesar, you knew you were putting your neck out there. But that Jesus was worth it. That Jesus was more precious than anything that the Roman Empire could give. And prison and death awaited those who were followers of Jesus. What, what are the things that are trials for us? I, I would say that many of these are the same. That we get mocked, that, that we lose privileges, uh, that we can be marginalized, that we can lose our family members, and in a different way. We have followers of Jesus in our church. Uh, there was a Hindu uh, girl in our church, and when she became a follower of Jesus, uh, lost her whole family. We have a girl who was a Muslim uh, who became a follower of Jesus, and she just told me, uh, Pastor, if I accidentally get hit by a car, just know it's not an accident family is, has said, you are dead to me. There's a real cost for so many people to follow Jesus, even around us. They don't have generations upon generations, followers of Jesus. And in our culture, we cancel people. We're really good at that, aren't we? We live in a cancel culture where if you uh, sin against culture, not against God necessarily, but if you commit cultural sins, we just cancel you. We block you from media, from social media. We don't let you have a voice. This is what we do as, as a culture. We, and, and I actually think probably during our lifetime, my lifetime, my kid's lifetime, that probably things are going to get far worse. And I'm not like a doomsday preacher, but we just see it progressing very quickly. And and we just need to be clear that we're not a Christian nation. No nation is ever a Christian nation. There are nations with Christians in it, but there's only one kingdom of God. And that's made up of every nation and every tribe and every tongue and every people group. And that's a nation that, that exists, a kingdom that exists to worship King Jesus. So how do we go through trials? How do we go through trials? Because you're going to go through them. And I don't want to give you like a four-step plan. And you need to remember that James is looking at people saying, I don't know if you're going to be here next week. I don't know if your dad is going to make it. They might kill him this week in the prison. So this isn't like memorize these four steps on how to make it through a trial. This is real life stuff for them. Tim Keller says the ultimate way to handle troubles is through the, oh, sorry. The ultimate way to handle troubles of life is through worship. The ultimate way to handle the troubles of life is through worship. That we don't stop worshiping him. 
And so what does James say? Let's look at James 1, 2 to 4. He says, count it all joys, my brothers and sisters. Count it all joy, my brothers and sisters, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. The first thing that James says is, when the trial meets you, Allow for joy to spring up. And it's like, James, you really don't understand life, do you, brother? You're some seminary nerd hanging out in some ivory tower doing theology away from real life. But we know this isn't true of James, don't we? He's living this stuff out. And he says, count it all joy. Now, joy is not that big perma smile. In fact, joy often comes with tears. Here's what joy is. It's an unnatural, unnatural reaction of deep, steady, and unadulterated thankful trust of God. Joy is this deep thing that when we meet trials, it just springs forward and we don't even know where it's coming from. It's not this fake it till you make it type of thing. It's you going inside saying, spirit, I don't like what I'm encountering. Would you tap into your fountain of joy and cause it to come forth? Because I want to be able to count it as joy that I am meeting this trial. This trial does not have to steal my joy. It can actually flaunt it. Do you get that? Our trials can flaunt the joy that comes from following Jesus. I would say that joy is celebration while weeping and singing while being punished. And we see these these illustrations in scripture, don't we? Paul and Silas were arrested and put in prison and they were actually in stock. So they're just kind of like hanging out literally. That's all they could do. And when everyone was going to sleep, what do they do? They put on a concert like you guys did the other night. Everyone's trying to sleep and it's like they just start singing. And where is this joy coming from? Prisoners don't sing. One of the things that was noted about the the slavery that happened in the United States is that the slaves, when they were being punished, would sing the loudest. Where does that joy come from? You cannot beat the joy out of someone. If you've read Fox's Book of Martyrs, you would see as people are literally having their flesh peeled off of them and being burned, they're singing to Jesus with joy. You can't fake it. Perma smiles aren't real. James is saying you need a deeper Christianity to walk into these trials. You need a Lamentations. For those of you who know where Lamentations is in the Bible, please, you can turn there. Lamentations chapter 3. I love the honesty of Jeremiah in Lamentations. He says, God, you're like a bear for me. You're shooting your arrows into my liver. It feels like you're out to destroy me. And he says in Lamentations 3, verse 19, remember my affliction and my wanderings, the wormwood and the gall. My soul continually remembers it and is bowed down within me. So in the midst of these big lamentations, listen to this moment of hope. He says, but this I call to mind. This is going to be where the joy comes. This I call to mind and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They're new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. It is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. This is the joy that pops up in the midst of the trial. Call to mind. Call to mind. Remind our hearts of who Jesus is and what he has done when you are walking through the darkest trials in life. And you don't know when it's going to come. We don't know when it's going to come. But what we do know is that faith in trial produces steadfastness. There's, There's a personal benefit to this. 
James says in, in verse um, three, you know the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. Um, where I live in Montreal, everything is just flat. And so I, I, running is really, really great and fun. And this morning I said, oh, hey, Jess, I'm just going to go for a quick run. And uh, I ran up like a two kilometer hill. I'm like, no, 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 surely it's going to like stop. But it, it doesn't stop. And I'm having to tell myself what runners say, like, oh, this is good for me. This is going to be good for me. I like this. You like this, Dwight. This is fun. When you know it's not really that. In the midst of trials, we can go to the Lord and say, Lord, I don't like this. I don't like that I'm walking through this. But you have given me a joy that circumstances don't take away. And Lord, I know that this hill is really good for my soul and that it's going to develop a steadfastness and it's going to sharpen me and, and make me more like you, Jesus. So don't take it away until you're done with what you want to do with this trial. Have you ever prayed that? Have you been in the midst of a trial and said, please don't take this away until this trial has its full effect for what you want to do with it? We want to just figure out how to get around it, but you can't get around it. You got to go through it. But there's also a benefit for those watching. It's not just so that you have these incredible uh, spiritual thighs and calves to be able to run hills. There's a benefit for those watching as well. As you go through trials, people are watching. Does your Jesus work? Does your Jesus work? It's like someone who spends all their time in their garage. I don't know if any of you are into model cars. I, I'm not, so I don't have a lot to say about this, but good on you for that. But my uncle, my uncle does, and he would have these cars in his garage. Beautiful, beautiful cars. And I would see them, and he's working on it, and I'm like, hey, Uncle Steve, why don't we take this car out? He's like, no, 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 you can't take the car out. I'm like, then why do we have this thing? You talk about it all the time. You work on it so much. Let's drive this stinking thing. This is amazing. No, we don't drive this. And I think that's so much of, of how we live with, with Jesus. We like to talk a lot about him, but he stays in the garage. We don't show him to others. We don't speak about how we're working through things. We like our private little life with Jesus. But people aren't interested in you sharing with them your systematic theology that you memorized. They want to see that this Jesus actually works. They want to see what this looks like when you're losing a loved one. They want to see what this looks like when you've lost your job. They want to see what this looks like when you're given a bad diagnosis. They want to see, does Jesus work? That the Lord, I think, allows us to go through things so that we can declare who he is and how we're dealing with it. You know, I shared yesterday a little bit about my dad uh, passing away recently. And I don't know how many times I got to preach the gospel to all the nurses and the doctors and the hospice workers uh, because they're, they're trying to understand what's going on. And they're like, oh, okay, so we're going to go about it this way. I'm like, oh, that's fine. But this is what my dad wanted and here's why. And I would just get to talk about who Jesus is. And we were playing, we were playing worship music and the woman came in and she says, uh, one of the nurses came in and said, oh, this is really beautiful music. And I just stopped it and I shared the gospel with her for 10 minutes. Probably I took her away from actually caring for my dad for those minutes. Uh, but I'm like, you need to hear about this. This trial is an opportunity for you to get to understand how Jesus moves outside of the garage. And God allows for trials to come so that we would be reshaped. He says in verse four, let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Lacking in nothing. And in the midst of your deepest, darkest trials, God isn't going anywhere. God's not going anywhere. He hasn't abandoned you. He hasn't forgotten about you. He wasn't like, ah, oh, dang it. I didn't put on my calendar that this thing was going to happen. I'll, I'll be there as soon as I can. He's there. He's walking with you. God is very present. And I would say almost most present in the valley of the shadow of death. That he is a comforter for you there. That he's not bailing out. 
that you can't be so bad that he's going to be like, all right, I'm removing my name from you. That he wants to lean in those moments. The second, so joy, when we experience trial, it's like, Lord, please help my soul to erupt in joy. When you meet trials, first thing, think of joy. I want joy. I want joy. Not about perma smiles. I want joy. Second thing, ask for wisdom. Verse five to eight, if any of you lacks wisdom, how many of you here lack wisdom? Right, more of us lack wisdom than know where Lamentations is in the Bible, good. All right, if you lack wisdom, you're dumb and can't be my follower. No, 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 that's not what it says. If any of you lacks wisdom, let them ask God who gives generously to all without reproach and it will be given him. But let them ask in faith with no doubting for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. That person must not suppose that they will receive anything from the Lord. He's a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. We often lack wisdom for this trial. I've been with some of the smartest people I know and we've ended up in a trial and I look at them and I'm like, what do we do? Like, I have no idea. I'm like, you've done this a lot though. You're supposed to know what we do, right? I'm the younger person with you. Give me wisdom. They're like, I don't have wisdom for this trial. But what does God say? Hey, right here, just go ahead and ask me. I want to give it to you. Ask me for joy. I'll show up with that. Ask me for wisdom. I will give you generous amounts of wisdom for everything that you are going through. He is eager to give it to you. I wake up earlier than my kids on Christmas morning, I think. I am so eager to give stuff to my kids. I really am. I'm so eager to give things away. God is eager. He's more eager. He's a much better dad than, than, than any of us can ever be. He's eager to give wisdom to his kids. But we're told to ask expectantly. When my kids come to me and they, you know, on good days, it's like, dad, I would really love to have a snack if you don't mind and you have some time. But usually it's like, dad, snack, snack, dad. It's like, no, like, let's at least go for forward sentences, right? Let's try for four words. And we're trying to get them to that point where they're actually properly asking for things. But the idea is that they come to me and they know that I'm able and I'm willing to give them snacks. I want to do that. And God is saying, I want to give you wisdom, but come asking me expectantly. My kids come and they, if they were betters, they would bet that dad is going to give them a snack. They know that. And God is saying, bet on me. Now I'm not endorsing betting. Okay. Don't, don't bring that question up on Wednesday night. All right. I'm not doing that. But God is saying, bank everything on me. I'll be your stock that's always going to come through. Now, the doubt in these, in these verses. I, if you're like me, you doubt a lot of things. I have all kinds of doubts. But the doubt here isn't that you can't have any doubt at all. It's don't doubt God's ability and desire to give you wisdom for these trials. It's not just doubt in general because he's able, he's near. And, and doubt and, and lies, the doubt and lies that we experience about God's ability, do you know how we overcome them? We rehearse what's true. How many of you have ever done a catechism? All right, good. I just assume, by the way, most of you don't raise your hands. <laughs> so just because you're like, I'm not, he's asking me to do it, I'm not doing it. That would be me, right? I'm not raising my hand. That's going to be three calories burned. I ram, right? But doubt and lies, the, the reason why we historically have catechized the church is so that when we get into moments where we doubt and we forget, we have these, these truths that are stored in our heart that can burst to the surface all of a sudden. It shouldn't just be rote memory. It's storing up treasures for moments where we forget. And so when we experience trials, number one, joy, Lord, give me joy. Number two, Lord, give me wisdom. And number three, let me boast in my deepest identity that that I have because of you. In James 1, 9 to 11, let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation and the rich in his humiliation, because like a flower of the grass, he will pass away. 
For the sun rises with the scorching heat and withers the grass. Its flower falls, its beauty perishes. So also will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits. James is saying, you're rich, congratulations. You're poor, congratulations. None of that matters. Your identity is not in what car you drive or what car you wish you drive or whether you wish you had a car. None of that stuff matters. Your deepest identity is found in that you are a son or daughter of the living God. We need to rehearse that in those moments, that the trial is not indicating that I am a a hated or disliked son or daughter. That's not what that trial is doing. And so in that moment, we have to go, this is what I do with my kids, this is what we do with our church all the time. Okay, who is God? We get in this trial, who is God? Is God out to get you? No. God is a benevolent, loving, compassionate God. All right, what has God done for you? Well, God loved me and is so benevolent that he would send Jesus to go and die in my place and rise again and send his spirit to live inside of me. Great, so who are you? Well, I'm a child of God that's full of the spirit. Now, what are you supposed to do? What are you supposed to do with that? Well, I'm supposed to believe that and and live out of that reality. And so we rehearse this with our people all the time. And we go through all the different aspects of life with who is God? What has God done? Who are you? And now what are you supposed to do? Because it reminds us that, that, that our deepest identity comes from him. Our deepest identity isn't found in what we do. It's found in what's been done for us. Listen to to Romans 8. Sometimes, and maybe you're going through a a trial right now that you think, man, this trial could actually separate me from God or indicates that God has separated himself from me. Listen to this. Romans 8, verse 35. If you're going to memorize a a decent chunk of scripture, I would say start with Romans 8. Romans 8 has so much beauty that your heart needs all the time. Romans 8, verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? And then in verse 37, he answers it, no. In all these things, we are more than conquerors. Do you get that today? Today, more than conquerors. You're like, I'm just hoping to play some shuffleboard and not hurt my hip. It's like, you're more than conquerors in Christ. We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation, including yourself, will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. God has made sure that you understand that you can't separate yourself from him. He is that type of God that is pursuing you in your deepest struggles, trials, and distresses. And because that's true, we rehearse our blessings. In verse 12, blessed is the man and woman who remains steadfast under trial for one He has stood the test. He will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. You see, this is what this says, is that the trials don't win. Trials don't win. They just don't. We don't read at the end of the book of Revelation where Jesus brings heaven, the new heavens and new earth together. And he says, oh, but watch out for this trial that's coming. No more trials. One day there's no more trial coming. Trials don't win because Jesus is going to come back. And when he comes back, he's bringing his kingdom in fullness this time. And he's going to bring you a crown of life. And it's not a participation trophy. It's an indication that he has done this on your behalf. And he is saying, my inheritance is your inheritance. And do you know what we're going to do with those crowns when we're all together, all nations, bowing our knee by faith in, in faith to King Jesus, we're going to throw those crowns, indicating that we didn't do anything to deserve this. You're the one that gets the glory. Holy, holy, holy are you, Jesus, who has overcome the trial so that we can be here around your throne. 
And right now, in the midst of whatever trial you might be going through, you have real visceral value, meaning, and purpose that death itself cannot take. Now, let me just briefly talk about temptations. The new habits that that we want to form when we're going through trial, prepare for trials. Prepare for them. Joy, wisdom, rehearsing our, our identity and our blessings that we have in him, right? We meet the trial. That's what we do. Now, when temptations come, temptations are different than trials. And when temptations come, um, temptations are external. It's something that we want. They're often desirable. They look really good. There's certain temptations are definitely going to come. Probably today, there'll be temptations that come. And temptations are things that are going to lead you away from Jesus. So let me just ask right now, um, you don't need to answer, but what temptations are you facing in this moment? What temptations toward approval that you just want for that person or that group to approve of you? And if you had that, then your world would be made. What tempts you toward control? That if I could just control this element of life, then my heart would feel full. What what temptations of comfort are there? If I could just get that thing, if I could just get that house, if I could just get more vacation, if I could just retire at this age, if I could just get a moment of silence where children obey, right? Then my heart would be singing hymns of gladness and power. If I could just get that power, then I know that I've made it. What are the temptations that move inside of you? What are the temptations that are going to easily entangle you? Well, when temptations arrive, James is is helping us to understand what to do with them. And the first thing that he says is recognize the deception. And I'm going to be very quick about this, so you can go back through this later. Um, But recognize the deception. He says in, in verse 16 to 18, Don't be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. See, James tells us that God gives good and perfect gifts that lead to life, but temptations want to lead us into anything else. They want to lead us away. And often the best temptations aren't bad things. They're just good things that we make God things. They're good things that we make objects of worship. And so when some temptation comes along, the first impulse that we have is don't just jump at it. Don't just jump at it. Take your time. Process through. What is this? Paul talks about taking every thought captive. And the illustration that I have, it might be a crude one. I don't know. But um, the illustration is every thought captive is like putting an animal in a cage. So it's like this little bird, right? Cute little bird that, that comes toward me. And, and it's bringing this thought. I want to grab that bird by the throat, put it in a cage, shut it. And I want to examine that bird. And I want to say, bird, are, are, you bringing, are you bringing truth to me or are you bringing a lie? And if you're bringing a lie, I'm going to kill you, right? I don't endorse the true killing of little pretty birds, okay? But it's the idea that Paul's saying, take every thought captive. Don't just assume that your thoughts are pure and good and wonderful. We'll get into that uh, later on in, in James. Take every thought captive, examine them. Because the best deception looks like truth until you see the the other side. The best cults, the best cults that there are, 90% of it is stuff that you and I would agree with. They'll use the Bible. They'll, They'll know more about the Bible than you do. They'll know Greek words that you don't know. They'll know Hebrew. Uh, they might not know it well, but, but they'll know things that you don't know. And you'll be so impressed. Wow, I didn't actually think about this. But it's at 10%. It's the underbelly, right? It's the underbelly that's really ugly, right? We think that animals' faces are often cute, not their underbelly, right? That's usually the nasty part of them. 
So we recognize the deception. Secondly, we fight. Oh my goodness, we need to fight. In verse 14 and 15, James says, but each person is tempted when he's lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it's fully grown, brings forth death. If you're going to have a lion, if you're going to kill a lion, I know there's a lot of killing this thing. I'm so sorry. I didn't sleep much last night, so that's what you get. Um, is, it, is it better to kill a little lion or a big lion? I guess better is not the right word. That's a judgment call. Is it easier to kill a little lion or a big lion? A little one. All right. You guys got some sleep. Good. Tracking with me. All right. Yeah, it's easier to kill a little lion. You kill it before it grows. And here's a, what James is saying. Temptations come in so little and cute, but they want to kill you. They want to kill you. Their aim is to destroy you. And what, what Paul tells us in Romans, let me, let me turn there. In Romans uh, chapter 8, verse 13, I told you memorizing Romans 8 would be of utmost help to you. Romans 8, 13, Paul says, if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. You kill. You kill these, these little animals, these little temptations that want to come into your life that look so cute, but their desire is to kill you. You bring these temptations to the light. You involve others. We have something in our church called Conqueror Group. And this is a group for men who are battling pornography. And we bring the, this, this to the light. We let others see what we're going through. And then we put this to death. I wish my fist was microphone so it was louder, right? There we go. All right. And we put it to death. And that's just, that's just one thing. But we put these things to death. We're no longer victims. We are more than conquerors. We're not victims. Oh, I can't help it. I, I was made this way. Oh, I just have this proclivity. Oh, I have addictive personality. I've never met someone that doesn't have an addictive personality. Just what are you addicted to? What's your poison? What's your drug? We're all addi addicts. But we're called to rise up and fight. Paul talks um, in Ephesians about this armor of God. I heard a flannel, flannel graph, flannel gram. I don't remember what it's called, flannel graph. Right? And sometimes we get cute with that. We're like little armor of God and like I'm putting on the helmet and the breastplate and whatever, all that stuff. Right? We make it cute. But Paul is like, Paul, I think, is yelling at Ephesians. It's like a heavy metal grunge song. Put on the armor of God. Right? It's that. It's intense. It's, it's meant for us to actually do battle with. It's not cute. It's that lies are going to come to us that need to be put to death. Rise up and fight these temptations. Stop falling over to them. You don't need to anymore. You're free. And Jesus is better. I'm almost done. If you're timing me, I'm timing myself too, and I'm almost done. They said I had two hours, so I'll just slowly wrap up. Because I don't have anywhere else to go all week, actually. I'm here. Probably you're here too. Um, Hebrews 11, verse 24 to 26. By faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasure, treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. Ultimately, we fight temptations by looking and seeing that Jesus is better than anything else that we can get. You have to stare at Jesus until you see him more valuable than the thing that you want to go after. And the last thing that James tells us, and then we'll be done with this passage, in verse 13 of chapter 1, let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. God is not tempting you. He's not tempting you. He equips you to overcome temptations. So real Christianity, real Christianity is full of trials and 
temptations. And we actually use them when they come to serve his purposes of changing us and showing the one, Jesus, who has overcome the world. Jesus said to his disciples, take heart, I have overcome the world. Right after he talked to them about temptations. We use trials and temptations to serve his purpose of changing us and showing the one who has overcome the world. You know the story of Joseph? I'm assuming you do. Uh, it's a, a too long of a story for me to tell you now. But anyway, Joseph ends up like second in command in the world after being sold by his brothers into slavery like every good older brother should do. Um, in Genesis uh, 50, Joseph ends up uh, saving kind of the world, like it's a big deal. He, he figures out how to feed the whole world through, through wisdom. And uh, Joseph's dad dies, and so Joseph's brothers think, okay, now Joseph's going to kill us. And here's what Joseph says um, in Genesis 50, 19 to 21. Joseph said to them, don't fear, for am I in the place of God? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. To bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. So don't fear. I will provide for you and for your little ones. And he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. Joseph took the trials and temptations that he worked through and he saw the purposes of God in them. And James is saying, I don't want you to have to wait till the end. I want for, for in the midst of the trials and temptations for you to understand how to fight well now. So how do we respond? Well, trials. In the midst of your trials, do you find joy? Do you find joy? And I would say, like, children, have you ever seen a, a lost child? Uh, I've watched some of my kids think that they're lost in a crowd, and I'm watching them, and they start to get panicked, and they're looking around, all of a sudden they find my eyes, and what happens? It's like there's relief in their entire body. In the midst of trials, find the eyes of Jesus. That's what will bring joy. That's what will bring relief. And it doesn't matter what's going on around you. His eyes will, will comfort you. Do you lack wisdom? Are you going through a trial and you lack wisdom? You have a God that's eager to give it to you. And you're in a trial will preach blessing of Jesus to your heart in a dark moment. And if you're going through temptations, what needs to die right now? What stray snakes are you letting in? Right? Some people let stray cats in. That's weird to me. Cats in my neighborhood are dirty and gross. Constantly in heat, always, it seems. And it's like temptation. Some of us actually open up the door and let the stray snakes just come in. What temptations need to die? And is Jesus asking you in the midst of your temptation? Maybe you're, you're struggling with temptation while you're here. What part of Jesus do you need to see that's going to help you actually put that thing to death? Let me encourage you with this. Uh, last, last quote by William Cooper. He was a man who struggled with severe mental health problems. He tried to take his life uh, three times for sure and uh, just constantly struggled back and forth in deep and dark depression. But he wrote a lot of hymns. And, um, and he has this very famous line in one of them. Behind a frowning providence, behind a frowning providence, God hides a smiling face. That no matter what providence you're walking through right now, God's face toward you is one of delight and joy. He hides a smiling face. So as we face trials and temptations, look, look to Jesus who overcame them for us. Let me pray. And then you can apply this stuff all week long. Jesus, thank you that you are not a, a distant God hanging out in some corner of the cosmic galaxy, uh, hoping that we figure things out, but rather you are a, a ever-present reality. You are here with us. You're in our midst. I pray that, that you would take uh, words that, that are from me, and if they're just from me, that you would remove them. But I pray that you would take the words that, that you want to land in our hearts from, from your spirit and that you cause for them to be implanted in our hearts. That in the midst of trials, we would fight for joy. That we would ask you and beg you for wisdom. That we would rehearse who we really are because of what you've done. And that we would sing and preach that blessing over us. And as we are going through temptations, that we would recognize the deception. That we would kill 
the sin as it wants to enter into our house and that we would find you as far more valuable, Jesus. Would you make us a people that then go and declare that to one another and to our world? We love you and we need you, Jesus. Amen.